It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Shalam Kosravi, Professor of Social Anthropology at Stockholm University. Let me quote him in his own words. The geography and history that have formed my life have left me without any option but to become an engaged and public anthropologist. The life I have lived has been one of minority in constant negotiation with majority groups and in constant confrontation with states. In Iran, the country where I was born and where I spent the first two decades of my life, I was categorized and defined as a nomad belonging to an ethnic minority, the Bakhtiaris. In Sweden, where I have spent the past three decades of my life, I am defined as an immigrant. This explains my research interests in the anthropology of precarity, border studies, discrimination, racism, and homelandlessness. Professor Kosravi has had a distinguished academic career. His research interests continue to be in migration and refugee questions in Europe, as well as in contemporary Iranian society. One of his current projects is on undocumented migrants waiting for residence permits in Sweden, another on post-deputation outcomes in Afghanistan. Professor Kosravi publishes in Persian, English, and Swedish. Among his many publications with top publishers are the three monographs, Young and Defiant in Tehran, The Illegal Traveler, an Autoethnography of Borders, and Precarious Lives, Waiting and Hope in Iran. There is also the edited volume After Deputation. In his capacity of a public intellectual, his writings have recently appeared in the New York Times, as well as in current history. A prolific and versatile writer, he also writes fiction and short stories for exhibition catalogues, as well as for the Iranian feminist magazine Zanan E. M. Rots and the socialist magazine Red Pepper. The title of his keynote today is Walling, Unsettling, stealing. And before I hand over to Professor Sharam Kosravi, let me just say that there will not be any questions after the keynote. Thank you, Helena, for such kind of generous introduction. Thank you, Iasa. It's a great honor to uh, be here now. Um, before I start um, presenting my paper, let me um, say a few words how this paper uh, took its form. When I started thinking what to say in my keynote, an image came to my head uh, many times, an image from an Italian movie, Cinema Paradiso, made 1988 by um, Toronto. Torah. The scene that appeared in my head is from the end of movie when the main protagonist come back to his Sicilian town to attend the funeral of his mentor, Alfredo, who was projectionist in this small village. Alfredo had left the reel of film for him, which was a long montage of romantic screen kisses from different movies, kisses that were censored out of the movies ordered by the village priest. Alfredo had saved them and put them together um, for this young man. And then I knew what to say today. I share with you all the pieces that have been rejected, left out, dismissed, because they were regarded not anthropological enough or been regarded as too politicized. The pieces that find no home in anthropological journals or simply pieces that face the high wall of whiteness within academia. The title of my talk 
emerges from an urgent inquiry on the theme of this conference. The question is, what do we see when we look at the border from the other side? The story I want to share with you starts in an old house in a small village in the Bakhtiari province in Iran. During a visit uh, to my parents' house, I saw two Martson mats, known also as pierced steel plankings, that were used as balcony railing in the house. I asked my father where these planks come from, and he told me that he took them uh, a few years earlier from an abundant oil drilling site just a few kilometers away from the village. The village is located in the Zagros Mountain in southwestern Iran. These mountains have since ancient times been home for nomadic pastoral communities such as Bakhtiari, whose livelihood depended on green pastures and water resources. So was the life of the Bakhtiaris until the turn of the 20th century when the British Royal Navy decided to replace coal with oil as its principal fuel. In 1908, a British company backed by British government found oil in the Bakhtiari land. The first well in the Middle East was drilled. Well, in the, cent well, the central state went through the turbulent area of constitutional revolution. The British company signed contract directly with Bakhtiari tribal leaders who gained no more than 3% share. The contract obliged nomads and farmers to open their lands for oil extraction. They received nothing from the share. A land grab began. Bakhtiaris had for a long time been regarded as a savage race anyway by European travelers and colonial officials. A savage race is a waste race, and so is their land. Pastures were deemed wastelands and were confiscated. Poor farmers and pastoralists were turned into low wages, uh, laborers and guards of pipelines installed on their lands to carry oil towards tankers waiting at ports in the Persian Gulf. Bakhtiaris became provider of the fuel for the Royal Navy almost for free, so the Great Britain could dominate the sea during two world wars. The lure of oil brought many other European and American petroleum companies to the Zagros Mountains. And since then, more pasture lands have been turned into so-called wasteland, more communities and settled. The companies drill, move, cut, and deform the soil, rocks, rivers, farms. In the 1950s, Ajib, an Italian oil company, started a huge operation in search of oil two of them close to our village. Egypt brought pierced steel planks that were used as fences to keep local people out of the residence camps and work site. Egypt started also construction of huge network of long distance underground gauze pipelines. More pierced steel planks arrived. The pipelines were built through ancient Zagros forests and across rivers. Three pop gigantic um, pipelines carrying natural gas north have changed the Bakhtiari land forever. Pipelines open up the remote areas to deforestation, displacements of nomadic camps, and destruction of natural heritage. The social history of pierced steel planks started almost 80 years ago in the United States, in Martson, a small town in North Carolina. Easy to transport, and made for rapid construction of runways, the planks soon became a crucial part of American military logistics globally. Effective both in dusty region and mildly reinforced, the planks took American airfields everywhere, from islands in the Pacific to North Africa and Western Europe. Produced in large quantities, the planks were extensively used in many wars, among them Vietnam War and Second World War. After the war, the airfields were abandoned, and so were the enormous number of planks left behind. As war surplus, the planks have been re reused by civil companies in construction and industrial sites. 
Probably the planks used by Ajip in Iran, two of which ended up on the balcony of my parents' house, were the same as those uh, used in the construction of American airfields in Italy during World War II. Besides war and colonial extractions, the planks have also been used in another project to design an empire order, the border between Mexico and United States. The political scientist Victoria Hatton has observed that the pierced steel planks were recycled in the construction of parts of the U.S.-Mexico border wall, more specifically in San Diego, Tijuana area. And like what they were designed for, the pierced uh, steel planks used as border walls between U.S. and Mexico stand vertically and don't lie horizontally on the ground. They stand high to prevent crossing of human bodies. The holes ensure visibility and therefore more efficient surveillance. An optimal border barrier should be designed as see-through to allow visibility to other side. Since the time pierced steel planks were installed on the US border, more higher walls have been built and higher ones are promised to be erected. The American legal scholar, Mary Fan, writes that more border laws are shown to be inefficient, bordering practices become more object-oriented, resulting in longer, taller border walls. Interestingly, new walls are rising in a period when rate of migration from Mexico to United States is lowest since 1940s, and when, during a period, an uh, authorized border crossing is the lowest on record since 1970s. So what else can justify the planned construction of expensive border walls, if not excluding the people on, on the other side, in some sense, from the shared humanity? The symbolic meaning of border walls is greater than their physical presence. Borders produce new subjectivities, well, borders walls usually have short li lives. Their impact on people's ways of thinking remains for a long time. Borders signal that people on the other side are different and desired, dangerous, polluting, and even non-human. Verbal and physical dehumanization of border crossers from the South to the United States has never been so intensive as today during the current presidency. Construction of border walls and fences is a luxury not all states can afford. They are built by rich states against poor nations. All border walls, all borders between states are somehow also borders between classes. Well, the colonial oil companies turn Bakhtiari pasture lands into wastelands to unearth the wealth underneath the border walls can turn migrants' lives into waste lives by exposing them to danger and even death. The social life of pierced uh, steel planks from wars to, to uh, carbon extraction to border walls demonstrates that rather than neutral object, the planks have been tools for unsettling of communities, for expulsion that as traveling objects, the plank's meaning has never changed in relation to the practices and environments they have been used in. They remain infrastructure of oppression. They actualize what Ansteller calls imperial durabilities. The planks in the balcony of my parents' house are debris of an old but still brutal empire. The planks narrate the continuing history of relationship between wars and walls, racism and degraded environment, expulsion and revoked futures. A few weeks ago, I visited Idomeni railway station at the border between Greece and Macedonia in search of traces of a so-called crisis, refugee crisis. Along the rails, through the Balkans, there is another link between colonial rule in the past and current bordering and bordering practices. 
between fall of 2015 and summer 2016, a German imperial project from early last century uh, was resurrected to connect Germany to the Middle East. The Berlin-Baghdad railways was built between 1903 and 1940 to connect Berlin to the oil fields in the Middle East. People, travelers without papers from Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Afghanistan used the rails to guide them as they walked across borders on foot from Turkey and Greece to Macedonia, Serbia, Hungary, Austria, and finally to Germany. An infrastructure of empire was turned into an infrastructure of resistance. They walked on rails to avoid barbed wire fences. Both barbed wire fences and railways are symbols of the modern world. Railways and barbed wire sounds like opposite things, but in fact, they belong to the same logic of domination. Rails and fences function together in order to commodify mobility. Mobility is valuable when access to it is limited and regulated. Both invented in the 19th century, railways and barbed wire fences have been used in configuration of colonialized spaces. As for railroads, they tied the empire together and make colonization more penetrating and efficient. Barbed wire uh, was invented by an American farmer, 1873. It revolutionized the cattle business, but soon it was used against American native tribes. European colonists fenced open lands and turned them into properties. The consequences were so drastic for nomadic Native Americans, so they named barbed wire the devil rope. Let's call it what it is, devil's rope, or to stop, to regulate, to delay undesirable mobilities. Along the rails through the Balkans, travelers without papers face not only devil's ropes, but also another barrier, temporal barrier. The third part of my talk will focus on the temporal aspects of walling and, and settling. The question is, what are the temporal frames of the social and legal conditions of the people who are walled in or walled out? The core of colonial racism is the denial of coevalness. That is, that the idea that the other belongs to a different temporality. As post-colonial thinkers like Edward Said and Franz Fanon, and also the anthropologist Johannes Fabian showed the other to the Western self is placed in another time frame than the one Europeans feel they belong to. Bordering practices exclude people not only from national spaces, but also from national temporalities. People categorized as refugees, asylum seekers, and documented people are seen to belong to a racial time a non-white time that legitimizes bordering them, exposing them to criminalization, detention, and deportation. The other belongs to a different time and thereby to a different place. Michael Hanshard and Charles Mills have theorized the racialization of time in the context of black Americans' experiences of long-term walling and, and settling since the time of slavery. Racial's, racial time is defined as an equal, an equal temporal access to resources and power. In order to keep people out and limit their access to resources and power, they are excluded not only especially, but also temporally. This is exactly what Fanon meant when he said, you always come too late, much too late. In Fanon's understanding, we arrive to a white time, and it is always too late. We arrive to a pre-existing world of meaning, a world already shaped, and a non-white is not a subject, but only object. To a white time, 
that is assumed to be secular, civilized, modern, progressive, neutral, the racialized other comes always too late. Racialization means one arrives to a world in which bodies are already divided, a world where the access to resources and power is allocated according to this logic of belatedness. Arriving too late to the white world means low chances for, in Tal al Asad words, a sane life, a life in which one practically knows and is known practically by others. Not surprisingly, people in the condition of deportability use terms such as confusion, being lost to express the existential and political precariousness they find themselves in. In my studies, I have identified four conceptual dimensions of temporalities of border practices. First, waiting. Keeping people waiting is a way of experiencing the effect of power. Prolonged waiting engenders a feeling of not being in time with others, not being in sync with others. It can lead to alienation and the sense that what people around you do has nothing to do with your life and experiences as you live in a different temporality. The second dimension is delaying. Like keeping people wait, delaying them is a technique of domination. A central function of Israeli checkpoints is exactly this, constantly delaying Palestinians and thereby racialize their time. Borders do not stop people, but delay them. The journey from Milan to Rome by train takes several hours, but for Hamid, it took two weeks. The distance between greece turkey border and Komotini, small Greek town, is around 100 kilometers, one hour by train. Ahmed walked that distance 16 times, and 15 times he was deported back to Turkey. For Muhammad, the journey from Athens to Berlin took two years. Delaying is part of racialization. In May 2013, I arrived at Chicago airport. It was early, around 4 a.m. The border control officer was very, but not too sleepy to let me pass through like others, many of them Swedish passport holders just like me. But I had something extra, my body. He gave me a form to fill out, no pen at his kiosk, so he went to find one. After a while, he came back and handed me a pen, which stopped working when I barely had written my first name. So I went back to him and asked for another pen. He said, you don't need to fill out the form. No one will read the form anyway. The border did not stop me, but delayed me. It made me a different passenger from other passengers who were not different until we reached the border. I didn't understand what the border did to me until I came um, across this passage in a book written by Theodore Cannot, a slave trader. He wrote in 1854. The strict discipline of nightly stowage is, of course, of the greatest importance in slavers. Else, every Negro would accommodate himself as if he were a passenger. So, delaying reminds you your place in the racial, but also gender and class hierarchy. The third aspect of border temporalities is keeping people in the condition of circulation. A common experience of the condition of deportability and deportation is being sent back in time, expressed in terms of being sent back to square one. The sense of being back to square one renders how people are deprived of the time they have used, invested to settle down. 
keeping people in circulation is a way to defer and deny, the, deny them any future plans and make disruption of their life cycle. Life in circulation is a position of not becoming in what is supposed to be a normal life course. In the condition of circulation, one never gets the chance to finish anything. Unlike the disciplinary society that operates by immobilizing and confinement, the regime of circulating people is more similar to the Lausian control society that operates by keeping people continuously on move. People are sent back and forth between undocumentedness and deportability, between countries, between legislation, between institutions, between periods of waiting. In this condition, to borrow Melanie Griffith's terminology, life is formed by a sticky tie or suspended tie during delays and waiting and frenzied tie during border crossing or deportation. This keeps people in circulation, so their experience is usually an experience of not arriving. Circulation is a control mechanism that pushes them toward the square one again and again. In my research among people deported to Kabul, I see that the majority of them start a new migration trajectory in less than one year. An official report showed that up to 80% of deportees move again. This is only one example of a person I have been interviewing during several years, and this is the circulation I mean including multiple deportation, multiple new migration. And uh, this is sense of being sent back to a square one all the time. The young Afghans are stuck between a powerful transnational apparatus, which forcibly exclude and expel them from the global north. And the, on the other side, the circumstances and fo that force and forces which push them towards emigration from the global south. Deportation for them will not put an end to the migration cycle, but rather it's only one another phase of recirculation. They belong to what Peter Nayers has termed the portspra, combination of deportation and diaspora. The portspra, whose members are pushed into transnational corridors of expulsion. Circulation, not only in terms of geographical locations, but also in terms of various forms of expulsion. This group are ethnic, religious minority in Afghanistan, failed citizens. Then they are undocumented migrants workers in Iran or Pakistan. Then they are irregular migrants through the Balkans. Then they are failed asylum seekers in European Union. Then they are deportees in Afghanistan. And then they are undocumented migrant workers in Iran, and again, and again, and again. To be the Portsporic is a mode of being in the world, characterized by multiple unsettling, prolonged waiting a sense of always arriving too late in Fanonian terms. Nonetheless, the Portsporic practices and claims in the forms of remigration, mobilization of transnational networks reveals that the Portspora to be a space of resilience, resistance, and defiance with their mobility, imagination, stances, and claims Travelers without papers make an intervention in the construction of the global apartheid of mobility. The last part of temporalities is the value of a stolen time. Forcing people into prolonged waiting, delaying them, and keep them in circulation is part of an exploitative economic system that results in accumulation of wealth through a stealing time. Capital grows through a stealing of workers' time. This becomes even more explicit in case of deportation. We live in an age of mass deportation. Almost three million people were deported from the United States between 2009 and 2016. Several million more are scheduled to be deported in coming years. Europe is organizing mass deportation of almost 100,000 only to Afghanistan. 
Likewise, mass deportation is growing outside the global north. Saudi Arabia has deported hundreds of thousands of people every year in recent years. Since 2006, uh, in 2016 and 2017, more than one million Afghans have been deported from Iran and Pakistan. How much time has been stolen? When people are especially removed, they automatically are robbed of an amount of time. People, particularly long-term residents, have worked, built networks, paid taxes, spent time learning the local language and become familiar to the culture, fallen in love and maybe have children before being sent back to a country called home, homeland. The time people have invested to achieve these goals is lost by deportation. The time people have spent to accumulate social and cultural capitals is taken away by deportation. Sudden arrest and deportation means having no time, no chance to prepare for the journey, to sell properties, to claim wages, to collect one's belongings. Being deportable usually means that one has lived an informal life with a job that is not registered, with no insurance, with belonging registered, not registered, and documented. Arrest and deportation usually mean an impossibility of reclaiming this, an illegalized life, an illegalized time is unreclaimable since it is not considered to have existed at all. What about taxes and social security contribution people have paid before being removed? How about unused holidays? How many working hours are stolen? How much money did their employers save in form of unpaid wages? How much money does the state save in form of and paid pensions. How much surplus value has been produced for the capitalists through deportation globally? As Marx has shown, surplus value is generated from time the capitalists don't pay for, the time they steal from the, 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 from the laborers. The extra value added to commodity comes from a stolen time. Like people who have been trafficked, deportees' time is actively stolen. Using the term stealing shows how deportation is part of the accumulation of wealth in the hands of a few by disposing deportable people of their saved, spent, and invested time. Let me bring the story to its end in the same village it began, my parents' house with its balcony of reclaimed planks. Today, of the abandoned drilling site where the planks were originally used, there are only ruins left. International sanctions prolong wars in the region, political oppression keeps unsettling communities. The wells are capped. Only debris is left reminding us of va vandalized forms of life, failed promises of modernization, and a stolen future. The capped wells, interestingly, are used as a metaphor by people in the village when talking about lack of future there, where the prospect of a better future will not be actualized, so they seek it elsewhere. But between them and elsewhere, with the future, there are many walls. Recent ethnographies from different parts of the world, from Chile and Argentina to Southern Europe, East and West Africa, the Middle East and South Asia, show how unsettling community and making them precarious have been, become political schemes targeting not only non-citizens, but increasingly also racialized citizens and other vulnerable groups. What these studies demonstrate is a systematic precarization by the state through brutal policies of social abandonment and destabilization of the life itself, of bodies, and settling of communities, and stealing of people's time through keeping them, waiting, delaying them, and sending back 
sending ba them back and forth between institutions. Uh, staying, moving, settling is of course a larger field than what I uh, discussed here. Many people move and stay as they wish. Some other people can afford the high price of citizenship in the legal market. Many move for love, others for education. Who can move and who can stay? And, uh, and under what conditions? And who is placed in waiting rooms and in constantly delayed or sent back to square one? Who enjoys a linear trajectory of departure, arriving and settling? And who is kept in the condition of circulation and is robbed of her time? What I aimed to do today was a radical historization of the theme in order to denaturalize, otherwise naturalize, and to politicize, otherwise depoliticize, the current border regime. And also to emphasize that bordering practices refer to more than lines between two states and include more actors, different practices, organization, and histories. And moreover, um, as Arjun Apadrai has shown us, um, studying biography as things is important to understand the politics of design and materiality shaping borders. A radical historization shows that bordering and border practices, in a sense, are colonial practices. Thank you. Thank you.